السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم وملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والكتاب الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيدي ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ود كثير من أهل الكتاب لو يردونكم من بعد إيمانكم كفارا حسدا من عند أنفسهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الحق فاعفوا واصفحوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره إن الله على كل شيء قدير وأقيم الصلاة وآت الزكاة وما تقدم لأنفسكم من خير تجدوه عند الله إن الله بما تعملون بصير رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين In today's khutbah, inshallah ta'ala, I'd like to share with you some reflections from two ayat of the Qur'an that belong to Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 108 and 109. And I'll start with the latter ayah and then go back to ayah number 108 uh, to illustrate something. Allah Azza wa says, وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاءَ And I think everybody here in the audience has at least heard that phrase once before. Establish the prayer and give zakah. It's very common. وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And whatever good you do, whatever, whatever investment you make for yourselves of any kind of good deed, تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ You're going to find it with Allah. None of your good deeds are going to go to waste. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ No doubt Allah is in full view of everything that you're doing. Now that seems like a pretty general and universal statement. You could actually just you know, talk to any Muslim about the importance of establishing the prayer and giving zakah and doing good deeds and having hope that Allah Azza wa Jal will count those deeds towards something meaningful and we pray that Allah does that for all of us, all of our deeds that are good and small and overlook our, our mistakes, you know, big mistakes and small mistakes on the Day of Judgment. But it's remarkable where this ayah occurs. And this is part of the beauty of the Qur'an, everything is in a particular place. And if you don't appreciate where this ayah occurs and what was Allah actually talking about already, he was actually, it's, this is in the middle of a, a, another khutbah, basically. Allah is giving us a set of lessons, and part of those lessons is establishing prayer and giving zakat. Then it gives it a new wisdom, a new dimension that you otherwise would never know. You wouldn't even know that this is actually teaching you something much more than if you just looked at the ayah entirely on its own. So what is Allah talking about before? He's actually talking about a very big problem that exists in the Medina, in the city of Medina, for the Muslims at the time. Allah says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا A huge population, no small number, from among the people of the book, really intensely would love something. They love that. لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا If only there was some way that they'll be able to turn you back after your faith, after you've become believers, into kuffar, into disbelievers. They are extremely frustrated 
meaning the tribes of the Christians and the Jews that are in the city of Medina. And because, of, because this is Surah Al-Baqarah, there's more of an emphasis on the Jewish tribes, because that's the primary conversation in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah is highlighting a, a feeling that these people have deep inside of themselves, because so many of their own members, of their own congregations, have now taken shahada. Now they are companions of the Messenger wasallam. Their loyalties have shifted. And this burns them on the inside. They desire somehow they can get their people back. It actually reminds me of a documentary I saw not too long ago, uh, Turning Muslim in Texas. And it was, it's almost 10 years old, the documentary now, and it was a preacher whose son became Muslim. And they interviewed him and his wife. And they asked him, you know, what do you think about your son having become Muslim? I pray for him every day. And one day he's going to become a, he's going to come back to Jesus. And when he does, he's going to be an amazing, a dynamic preacher. That's what the mother said. And she said, it would have been easier if he just told us he's gay. You know, that's what she said. They, they prefer that as, as abominable as that is to the Christians. It's not like it's acceptable to the Christians. But having their son become a Muslim, that was a much bigger problem. So there is this huge, huge problem. And by the way, you'll find this sentiment not just limited to here, but you'll find it across families where people take shahada. They're, you know, I know I have many friends who become Muslim. And their families were not religious. They were Hindu, but not religious Hindus. They were Buddhist, but not practicing Buddhists. They were Christian, but not practicing Christians. But as soon as this boy becomes Muslim, all of a sudden there are crucifixes all over the house. All of a sudden they're getting up early to go to church on Sunday. All of a sudden like their religious sentiments spark because we have to fight this, you know. So you have the sentiment particularly about who? The Jewish tribes of Medina who are losing their congregation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now let's talk, dig a little deeper. This is not just talking about any Jews or any Christians. Actually the criticism, if you've been following the arguments of Surah Al-Baqarah, is about their leadership. It's the ulama al-Yahud. It's the rabbis. They're the knowledgeable among them. And the knowledgeable among them are particularly upset that their congregation is dwindling, their numbers are going down, somebody else is taking their numbers. If you keep following the arguments of the Qur'an about these people, this group of people, they were religious, and by the way, before Muslims, the, the Islam before us is the Islam that was given to Musa salam, the Sharia that was given to Musa salam. So the Jewish tribes are basically what is left of Islam centuries later. So we don't just think of them as another religion, we actually think of them as a deteriorated version of Islam. Don't think of them as another religion. As a matter of fact, there, there's a reason Rasulullah was given the instruction to pray in the same direction as them and fast on the same days as them. Because we're not supposed to think of them as a separate entity. In the same surah, that, there's no other nation Allah does this with. In the same surah that Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, before He does that, He says, Ya bani Israel. He addresses them directly. You know, He does that over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, there is no Ya ayyuhal ladheena kafaru in the Qur'an that's direct. It's Qul Ya ayyuhal kafirun. The direct address is actually to the believers. And you'll find it also with the people of the book, Ya Bani Israel. There is one ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena kafaru la ta'tathiru al-yawm. But if you study its context, even that's talking about the Akhirah. It's not talking about Allah addressing them on this day. La ta'tathiru al-yawm, inna ma tujzawna ma kuntum ta'amaloon. That's in the Akhirah. But the point I'm trying to make is they're rabbis. I want you to understand what happens to a Muslim community, because that's what they were. A Muslim community that becomes corrupted and deteriorated. What happens is they're ulama. They're ulama. They beca basically became businessmen. يَشْتَرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا They sell the ayat out for a small gain. That's the criticism that's given of them. And these people, they don't think of their congregation as a following that they are responsible for. They want the best things for them. They want to help their families. They want to get their young boys married. They want to get their, you know, their, their marriage problems sorted out, etc., etc. This is not their concern. Their concern is the donor base comes from these people. And when they, come, when they have a problem, they're going to come to me for a fatwa, and I'm going to charge them a fee to give my fatwa. And if my donor base becomes less, who's going to come and who's going to donate for my, my upkeep? So when these people are going off to the Prophet, there's a lot of checks leaving. There's a lot of paycheck, weekly, weekly donations leaving out of the hall. This is a big problem. We can't have this. This is unacceptable. And so they saw this as a serious problem. It, it hurt their bottom line. <laughs> It was actually a matter of business, straight business for them. It was straight business. Hasada min indi anfusihim. Some a jealousy that emanated deep from within themselves. There's another thing here. 
that we have to understand about the corrupted religious psychology of those people. These were qualified rabbis. They studied many, many years to become what they became. And here comes this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nusammihi Rasulullah. We call him the Messenger of Allah. They don't. And the first thing they look at him is like, this guy? Him? He can't even read. Actually, they considered the word ummi, or what we commonly translate as unlettered, as an insult. And that's what they called him. How is he going to be? What are his qualifications to lead a congregation? Why are people leaving me? I have all these ijazat in Torah, in Talmud. I have all these credentials. I'm a alim. I give these fatwas. And they're leaving me and going to him? This is ridiculous. How can that be? In other words, that you know, when you study the deen of Allah, and the sharia of Musa a.s. was also the deen of Allah. But when you sincerely study the deen of Allah, you're supposed to become more humble. The more you study Islam, the more it should remind you of what it means to be a abd. And what, what Allah's place is as rabb. And the more you recognize that, the lower you become. Because there's no lower job than abd. Right? So it, the more knowledge you and I gain, it's actually supposed to make us more down to earth. But unfortunately for these people, their knowledge of the deen of Allah made them feel like they're somehow superior to everybody else. Even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa This is a serious problem. This is a very serious problem. And so there's this jealousy in them. How come people are coming and listening to him? They're not coming and listening to me anymore. And there's even a bigger problem. Why can't they accept the Prophet sallallahu As a matter of fact, the Quran will tell us that the most knowledgeable among them knew the Messenger of Allah and they knew Islam and they knew the Quran like they would know their own children. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They recognize him like they recognize their own kids. But why not accept them? Why not accept? You know? Even the Quran actually questions the, the, the optimism of some of the companions. Look, these people know Torah. These people know Injil. They should be first in line to take the Shahada. But Allah corrects that and says, You're really hopeful they're going to accept what you're saying? Well, why not? Because if we accept what he's saying, all of my years of credentials and all of my degrees where people come to me and ask me for, for my fatwa, now if I go to him, I'm accepting that when, if, if anybody ever comes to me, I'm going to say, Allahu a'lam wa rasuluhu a'lam, go to him. I don't know. I can't say anything anymore. All my credentials are gone. They don't mean anything in front of the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know? So then, what am I, just another person? Is that what I'm going to do? Just sit among the rest of these people? So there's this hasad that is emanating inside of themselves and they now have whatever plans they can hatch to try to bring people back from Islam the imanikum kuffaran after your iman, they want to bring you back into kuffar. Some things I want to share with you about the language of this ayah before we go on is that, you know, Allah mentioned the word imanikum, not ba'da an amantum. Ba'da imanikum, the mustard, the, the, the noun is used. And what that means in simple English for the rest of us is that Allah is saying that your faith is firm. They can do nothing to shatter your faith. And that's why the word law is used also. Law actually is used when you, you wish something would happen, but you know it can't happen. It's impossible. إِذَا كَانَ الْأَمْرُ مُسْتَحِيلًا نَسْتَعْمِلْ لَوْ Right, when, when something can't possibly happen, then you see the word لَوْ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَارًا means they could wish all they want, that they could take your iman away and make you kufar again. They are incapable of it. What are we learning from that? We are learning that no matter what propaganda these people did, it wouldn't actually ever take away the iman of any single believer among the Muslim community. The only thing that can hurt the iman of a believer is that actually they have something missing in their own iman. Once their iman is complete, once their iman is set right, once that base is settled, then you can't shake it. If there's something missing in that iman, yes, it can be shaken. You see? So the problem is never going to be from the outside that somebody can destroy your faith. The problem is always going to be from first from the inside if this foundation isn't there. You know? So now, Let's fast forward to our times before we finish this ayah. Why am I sharing this ayah with you? I'm sharing this ayah with you because a lot of young people are really frustrated about what's happening about Islam nowadays. There's propaganda against Islam. There are people who hate Islam. They make videos about Islam. They have political campaigns against Muslims. They target Muslims. They demonize Muslims. They write books against them, articles against them, videos against them, blogs against them, news reports against them. Oh my God, they hate us so much. 
And then they make videos on YouTube, things like, you know, if you watch this you, 10 minutes and you won't be Muslim anymore. And some 17-year-old says, oh yeah, I'm going to watch it. I'll show you. And 10 minutes later, he's like, really? Wow, I didn't know that. And he's getting all messed up. And so because I get emails from all over the world, I get email, emails like, brother, do you know what the Christians are doing? Do you know what the Jews are doing? Do you know this video they made? Do you know this website they made? Do you know this blog they made? Oh my God, they're going to destroy Islam. Do you know they made a fake Quran? They did this, they did, and there's no end to what they've made. And they continue to make. I, you know, I live in the US, as many of you know. I live in the Bible Belt. 90% of the radio stations, when you tune in the radio, FM radio back, back home, 90% of them are Christian talk radio, right? Or country music, at least where I come from. But on the Christian talk radio, most of the time, they're actually not even talking about Christianity. They're talking about the Sharia law, or they're talking about the Prophet Muhammad. That's what they're talking about. They're attacking it constantly, constantly, constantly. I listen to this stuff every morning. That's what I listen to, you know? And they have their so-called experts on the stuff. And it's not, a, it's not a shallow attack. They're pretty sophisticated in their attack. But you know what? You, get, you start getting worried. Man, I better call them. I better respond to some of what they're saying. I better take care of this because, you know, we have to stand up for our deen. We can't just take this stuff lying down. It is emanating from a jealousy they have inside of themselves even after the truth has become clear. Now, what is the benefit of Allah telling us even after the truths become clear? For the people who have that kind of blind hatred towards Islam, clarifying to them the truth of Islam is not going to change anything. Because it's not like they're doing all of this because they're not clear about Islam. They're actually doing all of this because of jealousy, despite the fact that many of them are clear about Islam. That's not the problem. Now, the problem for me and you is that for a lot of young people, we have to respond to the kuffar. We have to take care of this. What do we, what do we, you can, Allah, Allah is describing this is a big problem. We need to react. Why don't we do something about this brother? So I say, okay, let's, let's Allah tell us what we should do. Because he's the one who introduced us to this problem. It's a pretty intense problem. And the Sahaba are aware of this problem. It's a very serious problem. To us, they're enemies of Islam. That time, they're enemies of the living messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam among their, in their midst. In their midst, this is a serious, serious issue. What are we supposed to do? Hey, let's let Allah tell us. In that same ayah, the next words, fa'fu, wasfahu, hatta yati Allahu bi amrihi. Forget it. Forgive them. Over pardon this. And wasfahu, turn the page. What they say in Punjabi, mitti pao, gali koi ni, There's no problem. Overlook, ignore it. It's not worth it. That's not my words, that's Allah's words. Let, let them bark. Let them say whatever they want. Fa'fu wasfahu. Until when? Are we going to listen to them like that forever, brother? We shouldn't respond. Hatta ya'ti Allahu bi amrihi. Until Allah brings His own decision. But brother, they have so much money. They're spending so much, you know, they have so much power. There are politicians behind them. There are media machinery behind them. There are millions and billions of dollars behind them. What about that? And Allah responds Himself and He says, In Allah ala kulli shay'in qadeer. Allah is no doubt in complete control over everything. Why are you so worried about their media power? Or their financial power? Or their political power? Allah is not undermining that the scheming exists. Allah is not, you know, making us blind to the fact that they don't have this kind of hatred. He's not making us blind to any of that. But Allah is also teaching us how you're supposed to respond. You're supposed to show fortitude. You're supposed to be focused on something much more important. You know, there are some young people, they spend a lot of time on YouTube or Facebook or for Islam, of course. You know, so they'll watch a video and then they'll, somebody will, you know, curse the khatib on the bottom. You Muslims are this, 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 this. And this guy will feel necessary to respond to them. Oh yeah, well you kuffar, we're going to get you one day. And, and then, then there's like pay, endless numbers of pages of back and forth because some Muslim kid thinks he's standing up for Islam. Just read one ayah. فَعْفُوا وَصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِي اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Brother, what are we supposed to do? Just forgive, do nothing? Okay, let's read the next ayah. No, no, you should do something. Do what? 
Establish the prayer. Instead of sitting at some hookah shop until 3 in the morning, discussing what the kuffar are doing, and then waking up for fajr at 11 a.m., and then strolling over for Jumu'ah half, you know, halfway through the khutbah, instead of that, how about you work on iqimu salah? How about you work on that a little bit? Wa'atu zakah. How about you work on the way you make your money? Because zakah is not just about giving money. You can't give money if you don't have money. And you, can, you can't give clean money if you don't have clean money. So if you're making your money through questionable means, then you're not establishing zakah. Just saying, you know, ita'u zakah, just that phrase alone is actually cleaning up of the Muslim economy. The entire Muslim economy. Every penny, every, you know, every pound that comes into your pocket should actually be permissible. If you're going to talk about giving zakat. Why don't you work on that? وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ And by the way, this is the starting point. Or just salat and zakat, right? There's another khutbah about just salat and zakat. What else are we supposed to do? Now understand this. There are people who say that the kuffar have such an elaborate plan to destroy Islam. We need to do something big to respond to them. And somebody says, how about we teach children how to recite the Quran? How about we teach our young people what the seerah of the messenger is sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How about we take care of our neighbors? How, do, how about we introduce people to the message of Islam with kindness? How do we... No brother, what's that gonna do? The kuffar are such a big problem, you need to take care of the big problem. These little things, they're not going to make a difference. What are you just going to build masjids? You're just going to run schools? You're just going to teach children? What's that going to solve? So you know what people do? They say the problem is so big, so we need to think about doing big things. And if you're doing something less than that, if you're just, you know, in a small circle teaching some young people, or you're just getting some kids off the street and just saying, hey guys, instead of going out and watching a movie, why don't, you, why don't I just meet you at the masjid? We'll just chat about whatever, and we'll go out for some coffee later. You're just doing that. Your work is worthless. Because, you know, the kuffar are still there, and their billions of dollars are still there. So... It doesn't count for anything. And how does Allah respond to this attitude? By the way, these people who say we have to have big plans, let me tell you something about them. Because I've gone through these phases in, in my early years. These, these people will talk about big things forever. And practically they will do nothing. Practically they will do nothing. They will sit there and talk about how the kuffar are doing this or that or the other. How we need to do this or that or the other. But sitting there on the ground, nothing actually changes. 10 years go by, 15 years go by. And then they get frustrated. We've been talking about this for so long. Nothing has changed. We need to take more drastic measures. And then they do insane things. Then they do things you couldn't imagine, like what kind of person would do this? Now on the, what's Allah's response? What does Allah want you to do? What does Allah want me to do? What does Allah want every young man and woman in this community to do? He says, وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ Whatever you invest, and I'm using the word invest on purpose. Taqdeem is used, you know, in, in archaic English translations, they translate, whatever you send forth for yourselves, which I don't think anybody here understands. Sending forward for yourself basically means investing. When you put money in a, in a, in a business, then you don't get the money back right away. You'll get it later on. Meaning you sent it ahead. A few years later, it'll come back to you. Allah is actually telling us to invest in ourselves. Not just in terms of the akhirah, which is obvious, but even in terms of dunya. There are things you need to improve about yourself. And you will see the gains of that later on in life. You know, so where, where do I begin? Akhi, I, I want to learn Quran, I want to learn tafsir. Why don't you start memorizing Quran? No, 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 tell me, how do I learn everything about Arabic? Okay, hold on. Why don't you start with memorizing the Quran a little bit? No, 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 give me something more elaborate. I need something more exotic. You need to invest in yourself. You need to put some time in for yourself. And when you do that, and Allah says, لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ of, This min is for tanawwa. What that means is, any kind of good. Don't underestimate the good that people do in a community. Don't underestimate the good that you're capable of. And Allah has, this min is very, it's a huge mercy from Allah, because the good that you're capable of, I'm not capable of. And the good that I'm capable of, you're not capable of. The opportunities that Allah gave you, He did not give me. And the opportunities Allah gave me, He did not give you. Every one of us has a different set of opportunities, a different set of challenges. And we have to make the most out of whatever life Allah has given us, and find a way of doing some kind of good for ourselves and for other people. And if you can focus yourself on doing something good, and you, that you will find with Allah. تَجِدُهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ It's such a, what an eloquent conclusion. No doubt Allah is in full view, especially of what you do. 
This bima ta'amaluna, you know, is muqabda, what's called muqabda for ikhtisas. It's exclusivity. In other words, especially the things that you people do, Allah is watching carefully. Allah is, has full view, especially of what you Muslims do. You Muslims are so obsessed about what the kuffar are doing, what the Ahlul Kitab are doing, what their propaganda is, what their attacks are. You're so obsessed with them, and you have no concern about what you're doing. And Allah says, I do not concern myself with what they are doing, I am concerned with what you're doing. Inna Allah bima ta'amaluna basir. No doubt Allah is in full view in regards to what you people do. The crux of this khutbah is that on the one hand, the, 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 the Qur'an actually makes us very clear about what's going on in the world around us. But on the other hand, Allah Azza wa also gives us profound solutions. Profound solutions, not simplistic solutions. When people become concerned about making themselves better, making their families better, making their communities better, making their families stronger, and I want to emphasize this, this, this point for you know, especially Muslim communities in the West, in the United States, in Europe, anywhere. We have the institution of the masjid. And the masjid is predominantly attended by men. That's the reality of the masjid today. It's predominantly attended by men. But if you look at the world outside, the world outside is actually attacking the institution of family itself. Families are being ruined. Marriages are being ruined. Parents don't know how to raise kids anymore. Parents don't know even how to talk to their kids. When a, when a child becomes you know, a teenager and starts acting up a little bit, parents have no concept, no idea how to deal with this kid. What do we do? Who do we talk to? Where do we get help? They don't know who their friends are. Husband and wife have a problem, they can't talk to anybody. The problem keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And the husband goes to, goes to work and you know, the secretary starts looking more and more beautiful. And that's what's happening. This is the fitna that's growing. But we have masajid that are full for salat. The masjid is supposed to be a place where families find refuge. The entire family. Women have support. Children have support. Men have support. The masjid is supposed to be a place where the family becomes a stronger institution. And the family, the, the family is what makes the masjid better. And the masjid is what makes the family better. These two entities actually have to work with, they need each other. They need each other. Because families need the support of other families. Where do you think good families are going to meet each other? <coughs> They're going to meet in the house of Allah. This is, an, this is a natural, divine institution that brings people together for good intention. This is, it's, it's Allah's plan. So when the mas masajid are abandoned, or when children are unwelcome at a masjid, or when there's no facilities for women at a masjid, they're just a, an afterthought. You know, more than half of our ummah, and they're just, uh, we just find some closet for them. You know, when that happens, then you know what happens, the, the price is not paid at the masjid, the price is paid at the family. Because those women never got a proper education in their deen, so they don't know what it means to be a mother in Islam. Those kids never made good Muslim friends. Because the place where they could have made good Muslim friends would have been at the masjid, they hung out a little bit. I'm not saying you come here five days, five, five prayers a day, that may not be possible for you. But at least bring your kids for Aisha. Okay, if you can't bring them every day, bring them two, three times a week. Just bring them, make your, make your part of your child's memory, the fact that they used to come to the masjid. This is actually something, it's not small, it's very big. You might think this is, you, and those of you that are working people, you know this is not a small effort. It takes effort to do this. It takes effort to do this, but you will find it with Allah. This is an investment you're making for yourself and your family. You know, you'll see the barakat of it. But these are the things we overlook, because we're too busy talking about the attacks of the kuffar. The things that we have to take care of right now that are ruining our, us and our families, we're not even addressing. You know, this is, at the end of the day, this is my message. Don't underestimate the good that you can do on a daily basis. Its value with Allah is huge. We don't think, you know, we don't think it's anything. It's a huge thing with Allah. That is that, you know, if we can internalize that, inshallah ta'ala, we'll see good effects in our community. We'll see good effects in our youth. Especially, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see these reports they have of young Muslims who become radicalized and become this or that. Well, you know, when you have a proper community structure, when you see one young, young man straying, his other friends say, hey bro, where are you going? Let's talk. And they pull him back in because now you have a community of young guys. And they're connected to Aima, they're connected to scholars, you know. 
So you, we can actually self-police our own community right now because we're so disjointed. We don't know what's going on in the mind of a teenager. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what videos they're watching or what's going on in their head because most of their discussions are online, not with actually real people. So I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal helps you and me take this advice more seriously. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes us concerned with things that actually matter and doesn't make us overwhelmed with the, with the attacks and the plans and the schemes of those who seek to hurt Islam. They are not our problem. You know, حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ Until Allah comes with His decision. Allah will deal with them. We have to deal with what our problems are. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us truly self-responsible, responsible for ourselves and our communities. And may Allah Azza wa Jal strengthen this community and every single family in this community. May Allah bless the marriages in this community, bless the parents in this community, give them the ability to raise good, righteous children, ambassadors of Islam. May Allah Azza wa Jal make you people a good model for Islam, for the people all around you, that they, they see you and through you they see the love the Messenger of Allah had Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for all of humanity. Like through you they see that this man was Rahmatan lil Alameen. Because the, the only remnant, the only trace left of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in this Ummah. That's all that's left. So we were all, we're it. We can, they can't see Rasulullah anymore. They get to see you. You know? So may Allah Azza wa Jal empower us to be able to do, to carry this heavy responsibility. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا